Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship together. We thank you for your love and your grace. And we pray that as we hear these passages today, that can be challenging, that can push us in our understanding, that you would be there to meet us in that challenge, that you would speak to us powerfully, that it would affect our lives and who we are, that words written and spoken long ago would still be spoken anew in our hearing today. So be with us, Lord. Speak to us. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you were with us last Sunday, you know that we began a series based on great works of art, where we talk about how these artists who were inspired by biblical texts take what they read and they try to express it in artwork and in architecture. And so what we're trying to do each week is sort of hold the Bible in one hand and read the scripture and then hold the artwork in the other hand and see how they come together, where they vary, and even more importantly, how God speaks to us through that work of art or architecture. <laughs> I shared a little bit last time how my passions are really in the arts and in theology. My first degrees were in music and French, and then I did a master's in theology, and then in thinking about doctoral work, thinking, how do I bring all these worlds together, my love of art and music, with what I know of the Bible? And so I was able to do a wonderful degree in theology and the arts, that sort of brought all of that together. And our courses really challenged us to think about our faith, not just as a head knowledge, but that God speaks to us through beauty, through our senses, through nature, through drama, through architecture, that all of these things can be a powerful medium by which God speaks to us. Now last week, if you were with us, we dealt with what might be the most famous piece of artwork, and that is this creation of Adam, that we see on the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. And we talked about that in that, we learn both from the scripture and what Michelangelo is trying to show us there, that our life is a gift from God. That while Adam might be lying there, muscular and ready for life, without the breath of life that he can only get from God, he lies there without the ability to move, without the ability to live. Our very life is a gift from God. We also learned last week that we are created in God's image. And what does that mean? I don't think it means that God looks like Brian Kirby, but it means that humanity has been given some powerful things that only up to this point in creation God had. The ability to love, to create, to forgive. These powerful things that God gave into us when God breathed life into humanity. The ability to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength and to love others as ourselves comes from that image of God instilled in us. We are the part of creation that is able to choose to love God, to choose to worship. And that choice, we'll see, comes back very powerfully today. And finally, we learn that God created us for a reason, that none of us are an accident the way we look, where we're living, how we are, that God has a purpose and a plan for each of our lives, that God seeks a relationship with us. And we see all of that in the text and in this beautiful painting of God really extending out to Adam as far as he can go to reach out to us. So today we're going to look at another famous piece of artwork that comes from the Sistine Chapel and it brings us to some powerful texts as we think about the last judgment. We'll talk about the history of this magnificent fresco, perhaps one of the largest frescoes, if not the largest, in the world. And what does it say to us? Well, first we've heard some very powerful texts already read this morning that I want us to look at first as we think about heaven and hell and who goes where. That's really the theme of this last judgment fresco, and it's going to be our theme today. Now, I will say that hell is one of those things that makes us uncomfortable. I grew up in a church that seemed to talk a lot about it. In the South, in America, in North Carolina, 
There was a lot of hellfire and brimstone, a lot of preaching about turn or burn, he used to say. And this fear that was instilled in us week after week that we were hanging over the void and could drop at any moment. And the feeling that people were sort of being scared into accepting Christ, like buying fire insurance, so that one day if your house did burn down, it would be covered. But I began to think, even as an adolescent, there has to be more to Christianity than just being scared of God's judgment, than just being scared of hell. That heaven, even this side of heaven, that's to be more about Christianity and our relationship with God and our love for others, not just a fear of final judgment. And as we think about the two, first I want us to look at what does Scripture really say? Well, earlier in the service, you heard this entire chapter beautifully read. Thank you, Andy. In Revelation 4, where John is on this island of Patmos, and he's writing, he has this vision. God allows him to catch a glimpse of what heaven looks like. And he uses the words that he is able to use as he talks about rainbow and jasper and all of these powerful images. The richest, most beautiful things he can imagine. He sees it in heaven. And he sees the people there worshiping God, falling down before the throne of God, saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy, holy. That their whole soul focus in heaven is on worshiping God. That we've come to this perfect place of peace where we're no longer worried about all the things of this world and all that concerns us and that our total focus is on God. Think about a moment where you've been in a worship service where you have felt so moved by the music, so moved by a prayer, so moved by some powerful element of that service, that feeling of connection, of worship, of closeness, that we get just a glimpse of at moments, when we finally remove the distractions and we're able to focus just in that moment. Now think about living that perfect moment of worship for eternity. That's what heaven is meant to be like. And Jesus talks to his disciples about going and preparing a place for them, going ahead of them. That would be a place for them, a place for us. They're worshiping God in perfect harmony. And the Bible talks a lot about that. In fact, the theme of Revelation is as much about what heaven is going to be like I think, as it is about judgment. Then we think about hell, this concept that is quite shocking and a bit scary. We find it expressed differently in different parts of the Bible. In the Old Testament, the word Sheol is used, a sort of holding place, a place that seems dark and scary, separated from God. And then when we get into the New Testament, the image is developed even more with words like Hades and Gehenna. Now, Gehenna was this terrible, awful sort of place outside of Jerusalem, south of Jerusalem, where the Canaanites would worship. And part of their worship there is that they would sacrifice their children in a burnt offering to their pagan god. And of course, to the Jews, it was like the worst thing they could imagine, this place where people out of worship of some pagan idol, would take their own children and do this terrible thing. And there, there was sort of a fire, like a big massive trash dump that just continued to burn continuously. So Jesus and others in writing the New Testament speak of this valley of Gehenna, this terrible, awful image of death and fire to show the extremeness that people would feel in separation being away from God. Now, there are lots of theories that people talk about. Will we actually have planes and a physical body of suffering? Is the suffering simply the separation from God? Being, knowing that for the rest of eternity, we've missed it. The sense that we missed the opportunity to go to heaven. I think, personally, that would be more torturous even than the physical pain. Knowing that we had the opportunity to choose God's love and to choose to go to heaven and that we didn't do it. And we heard this spoken about 
in the text that was read from Matthew 25. The Bible seems to talk a lot about these two. Jesus himself talks a lot about heaven and hell and who's going where. As we think about it, first we find that the theme of the Bible is really about God's love and God showing us that love in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9 tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he's our Savior, then we're saved. Confess and believe, and we're saved. That God has done all the work. God has paid the price. God has done everything possible to hand us this perfect opportunity to be forgiven and go to heaven. And so we see in that text a powerful description of our choice, of our believing in God. And then Helen read this very powerful passage where we see Jesus teaching sheep and goats, righteous, unrighteous. And here we have this interesting biblical tension because in the parable that he uses, it's about their lives and the way they live. He says to them, come into heaven because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was hurt, you helped me. And they say, well, when did we see you in that way? And what does he say to them? Whatever you've done to those around you, to the least of these, of my creation, you've also done to me. And then he says the very difficult statement, where he says to the others, go away. Go away into the separation. Go away into the place that's prepared for Satan and his demons. And I said, well, well why? why? Why would we have to go there? And Jesus says, because when you saw me hungry, you didn't feed me. When you saw me injured, you didn't help me. And so this tension that we find between Romans 10, 9 of confess and believe, on the one hand, but also Christ saying the way we live our lives, the way we live our faith, also plays a part in what it looks like to be a Christian. You see, sometimes for us as Protestants, we can easily go the extreme of, I've made my decision, I've accepted Christ, I've bought my fire insurance policy, I'm good. And now I'm going to do with my life whatever I want, I'm going to live the way I want, I'm going to spend my money the way I want, I'm going to treat others the way I want, because I'm good. I've made my decision. But it's interesting, this week, really researching, going back into the text, who goes where, it seems that we first make a choice, but then Jesus also says, the ones who love me are the ones who obey my commandments. And my command is that you love one another. So we have this decision to accept Christ, but also seeing the fruit on the tree. Jesus talks a lot about how you'll know a tree by its fruit. In another teaching in Matthew, we find that he says very clearly that those who are following me, it'll be evident in their life. So it's not just enough, I think, to say, I believe in God and I've accepted Christ. That is our step into the kingdom. But then the ramification of that should be lived out in our lives. Otherwise, if we don't see the fruit on the tree, if we don't see a life lived out in love that's overflowing from us, then we have to take a step back and say, well, was I really sincere? Did I really invite Christ into my life? Was my life really given over to God? Was my decision sincere? Because if it was sincere, then it would be lived out in my life. So it's another one of these biblical tensions where we have to hold both in check. It isn't just go and do good things and hope that your good things add up to enough. The Bible's clear that that's not the way, because then you're living your life without Jesus Christ. But I would also hold that it's not just enough to say I made my decision and I'm going to live my life however I want to. Because if that decision is sincere, then it must be lived out in the rest of our life. And this parable in Matthew 25 makes that clear. That our life must speak of the work of Jesus Christ in our life. So the Bible seems clear about heaven and hell. And in a moment... After we sing again, I'm going to come back and explore what heaven and hell look like in Michelangelo's The Last Judgment and how the text continues to speak to us in what we see in his work.